Okay, I'll give it one more minute. Okay, I guess we can start. Good morning. I'm Elaine Chapnick, president of the Larchmont Mamaroneck Local Summit, welcoming you to our January meeting, along with our co-host, LMC Media. Uh, this may well be the coldest day so far this year, but our program today will warm your heart as you hear a proposal from some of our Mamaroneck High School students involved in the Civic Engagement Project. I'll turn the program over now to today's chair, Nina Cuddy. Nina? Good morning, everyone. Thank you to our attendees. Thank you to Elaine and LMC Media. And especially thank you to Joe Liberti, who is a high school, Mamaroneck High School social studies teacher who is heading the OCRA program, which stands for, okay, uh, Original Civil Civic Research and Action, which is a particular program that he will describe to you. And four really talented and wonderful students who worked very hard on a study that they're engaged in right now, Justin Solis, Olivia Sundin, Jackson Owen, and Daniel Marsh. This, or, this group, uh, the program actually was begun about four years ago, and it was designed to encourage and enable students to become, I think the term was civic entrepreneurs. And I will let uh, Mr. Liberti take over and explain what they're doing in particular, this particular project is about something really important, increasing voter participation in local elections. And I'm going to let him take it from there because he certainly, and the students certainly know this better than I do. And thank you very much for doing this for us. Great. Well, thank you for the introduction. I'm going to just take a second here to share my screen and then I'll begin. Okay. So hopefully everyone can see uh, what I'm seeing right now. So, um, so good morning. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Joe Liberti. Uh, I've had the privilege to be a member of the Mamaroneck High School Social Studies Department uh, for almost 20 years now, which is somewhat hard to believe for me. Uh, many of those years I've been spent teaching uh, AP US Government and Politics uh, course. I'm also the founder and director of Original Civic Research and Action, shorthanded to OPRA, which launched in the fall of 2017. Um, and before I say a bit more about the program, and I'll try to keep this brief, because again, the students really are the, the main event um, and, and why we're here today. But I just want to take time to sort of, first off, uh, thank the summit leadership and its members for allowing my students to present the research and the initiative, which again is focused on increasing voter engagement. I also want to thank Superintendent Bob Schaps, the Board of Education, Central Administration, as well as, as, well as Building Administration, for supporting the creation of Original Civic Research and Action. And finally, I wish to thank uh, all of the various um, members in the community who have served as mentors to various uh, student, um, students and their OCRA projects over the uh, past several years. And specifically, I want to thank the mentors for this uh, group, um, and that is uh, Ann McAndrews, Kathy Savolt, and uh, Dana Gallagher. Again, they've been instrumental in this group making progress. Um, so Original Civic Research and Action is a program um, that is uh, really purposefully um, Sorry, yeah. Oops. there we go. Um, it's purposely integrated with the community. So it's a unique program in that uh, it really attempts to integrate the education at Maranek High School with the community. Um, and in doing so, it's the idea of leveraging the energy and interest of students with the wisdom and expertise of adults. In short, OCRA uh, only succeeds uh, with the continued commitment of community mentors. So what always struck me as odd um, is that we ask students, or at least want students to be civically engaged, um, but we really afford them little opportunities to practice the necessary skills, habits, and mindsets. Um, it's as if uh, somehow at the age of 18, young adults now of voting age will somehow magically know what to do within the civic arena. Um, to make a sports analogy, uh, it would be like uh, teaching students about the game of soccer in a classroom for four years and then telling them to go play competitive soccer and have a big turn. Um, you know, a soccer coach would never do that, and neither should we when it comes to helping young adults uh, become more informed and engaged citizens. Um, so what is original civic research in action? 
So Original Civic Research in Action is a unique four-year program. It's the only four-year program that I know of uh, in existence uh, in the United States. Um, there are programs that attempt to do similar things in a one-year period or in a semester period. Um, but OCA is the only four-year program um, that I'm aware of um, in uh, the United States at this point. Um, and I would say, you know, it's really about providing you know, interested students with the opportunity to sort of more deeply understand their community, research challenging local issues, work with adult professionals within the community, and become civically minded problem solvers for life. Um, as Nina mentioned early on, uh, sort of the tagline of OCRA is creating civic entrepreneurs solving local issues. Um, now, while it's called original, I also think need to credit sort of my inspiration for this four-year program. Um, and that uh, really needs to uh, kind of mention some of the existing programs that I think really exemplify this sort of um, experiential education that were in existence prior to OCRA. Uh, for example, the Performing Arts Program at Maranac High School, PACE, is an excellent example of this type of education. All of our music programs, and they're another great example. And of course, original civic research, all right? Um, that's a perfect example where students really, again, get to do the work of professionals uh, and do it within a public forum, which I think is so important. Um, it's not, to me, uh, you're not gonna get the most educational growth if students are working individually and privately. So there has to be a public component to this. Um, and the other inspiration for Oprah was my earlier work outside the classroom. Uh, many of you might remember that way back in 2012, I uh, took all of my AP government students up to the New Hampshire presidential primary to participate and better understand the campaign process. It really was from that experience that I realized the profound effect you can have on students by engaging them in the actual work, right? so learning by doing. Um, to some degree, um, the way you can think about uh, OCRA is sort of taking these sort of three components that are familiar to people and putting them together uh, into this four-year program. It's the blending of sort of traditional civic education where students come to understand their local government, their local elected officials and their roles and responsibilities. It's also about youth leadership development. Um, there are lots of youth leadership development programs, um, but that's just one component of, of OCRA. It's not only sort of helping students understand uh, their role within the community, understand local government, but it's also helping them develop the, the necessary skillship to be leaders. And at various points within their group projects, all of them are moving in and out of these leadership roles. And finally, and, and most importantly, uh, is the idea of a guided experiential education. You know, that's the idea of fully immersing yourself within an issue, uh, thinking critically about how one problem solves around that issue, bringing together the expertise and wisdom of community members as mentors, and then developing an action plan, implementing that uh, during their uh, final years in the program. I'll just give you one quick example, and then I want to leave the rest of the time for the students um, again, because that's, of course, why we're here. So uh, the ninth grade, it's a four-year program, so ninth grade program, uh, students meet uh, before school twice a week. And this is a chance for them to, uh, first off, learn a little bit of uh, local history, and then learn about local government and then they move into the research phase where they begin to uh, work with uh, qualitative and quantitative um, uh, uh, activities, analyzing data, collecting data to better understand their local community. Over the summer, they move out into the community and they conduct uh, community stakeholder interviews. And with all the information, they begin their 10th grade year where they begin to focus down on particular interest, is particular issue of interest. And out of that, they naturally form small groups and they begin to focus in on a particular issue. So the example I'm using on the screen in front of you was a group of students who are now freshmen in, in college who became quite interested in the, the, the disparities that they had recognized during the research in their ninth grade year, which also became evident in their interviews during the summer. They came back and wanted to kind of dig deeper into sort of the disparities um, that they saw through their research regarding sort of the achievement gap. Um, but with further research, they realized that some of these gaps between low-income and high-income students can be seen outside of school in terms of access to extracurricular opportunities and what is known as the opportunity gap. So by the end of their 10th grade year, they had found their issue and began to work on an action plan to address. And again, that issue being the opportunity gap, the disparity between low-income and high-income students and access to extracurricular activities outside of school. And with that, they began to uh, put into uh, action a 
solution, which was to basically connect small business owners who offer extra cook activities, like martial arts, music, dance, et cetera, with uh, low-income students at the elementary school level with the assistance of the school social workers. They began by just creating a spreadsheet, reaching out to small business, connecting back to the social workers, and linking the students of interest uh, to these potential extracurricular activities. Uh, when the pandemic struck, they didn't give up. They then created a digital platform that seamlessly linked small business owners who are willing to offer scholarships with the social workers who could easily connect the students. And so their uh, senior year, they uh, fine-tuned the platform. And over that next year or so, we're able to place um, you know, over 80 uh, low-income students into various extracurricular activities, um, not only uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, but during the pandemic, as well as into uh, last summer. Um, this is just a, a quick little screenshot of this digital platform that they created, where small businesses can log on, create a, a profile, and then the social workers can log in and see the available scholarships and then begin to plug in interested students. So this is just one of many examples of some of the work that students have done. Uh, now, projects vary across all types of issues, from environmental uh, to those affecting the small business community um, to things that are all about uh, sort of civic engagement. Um, and so it's really, in that sense, student-driven. It's through the research process they come to understand a particular issue, an issue that's of interest to the students. And then with further research and working with community mentors, they begin to think about how one problem solves around that. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and turn this over to um, this fine group of four OCRA students who are now seniors. Um, one sort of interesting note quickly before I turn this over is it's actually quite, it's rather fitting that this group is presenting uh, to the summit because it was this group, the class of 2022, that was the first class of OCRA students who regularly attended the summit meetings uh, back in the, um, the before times at the uh, diner. Uh, two of them would come every, every uh, monthly meeting and they would take notes uh, and enjoy the breakfast and then report back to students. So these are actually students who uh, at one point attended the summit meeting uh, back when they were held at the diner. So I will stop sharing and then turn it over uh, to these students. So thanks again for allowing uh, me to present about my program as well as my students. We're gonna start by introducing myself. I'm Olivia Sundin. I'm Jackson Owen. I'm Justin Solis. And I'm Daniel Marsh. And before we start, we want to sincerely thank the Larchmont Americ Summit for giving us the opportunity to share our work. And a big thanks to Mr. Liberty, who has guided us the past three and a half years and helped us so much throughout our project. So this is our proposal on aligning local elections with federal elections. So just some background before we start, elections in the village of Mamaronick and Larchmont are currently held on the first Tuesday, following the first Monday of November each year. Each village trustee and the mayor serves a term of two years, and currently they're elected in two groups. So in group one, three trustees are elected every two years on even numbered election years. And in group two, the mayor and one trustee are elected every two years on odd numbered election years. So here's that visualized. So odd year elections on the left here, you can see that there's one trustee seat up for grabs in this election, and usually two candidates running for it in an even year election. So the 2020 on the right, um, you can see there's three trustee seats open and can be up to six candidates or more running for these three seats. So the problem we've identified in our research is that local elections in the village of Amerinik face low voter turnout. This is particularly pronounced in odd year elections, which we'll refer to as off cycle elections for the rest of the presentation because of their non alignment with federal elections such as midterms or presidential races, right? So in odd numbered years, even the active registered voters, these are people who are voting in other elections um, turn out at low rates. In fact, only about 30 to 40 percent of these active registered voters, people already going to the polls, um, participate in off cycle election years. This is a problem because there are people, these are people who vote regularly and practice their civic duty of voting, right? But they're not turning out 
for these local elections because of the inconvenience of the off year cycle. So if we look deeper at the data, um, this is Village of Mamaroneck voter turnout data from 2010 to 2020. Um, so the green bars on this graph are even year elections or on cycle elections. So that's 2010, 2012, 2014, 2016, et cetera. The purple bars are off cycle elections. So 2011, 2013, 2015, any year there's not a federal race going on is an off cycle election. And even visually, you can see that the green bars are higher than the purple bars. Um, so turnout in even year elections is almost always higher than in off year elections. So if we go to the next slide, um, we can break this down more um, quantitatively, right? So we found in our calculations that there's roughly a 37% increase in voter turnout um, in on cycle election years compared to off cycle election years, which we feel is pretty significant. And when you look at the percentage of people who are active registered voters, right? These people who are voting in the federal races, but not the local races, you see that there's roughly a 10% increase in their engagement as well. So in off cycle elections, voter turnout is especially lower among communities of color. So in data that we gathered from the village of Mamaroneck, we found that um, voter precincts with higher percentage with a higher percentage of white population had higher turnout in off-cycle elections and voter precincts with a higher percentage of Hispanic and uh, black population had lower turnout in off-cycle elections. So this just means that um, in off-cycle elections, not all of the community is represented and different parts of the community are um, disproportionately um, have their voices heard or not heard depending on like uh, their demographic data. So in these charts on the left, um, we can just see that the more white a community is, the higher voter turnout they have, and the more Hispanic a community is, um, the lower voter turnout that they have in off cycle elections. So this just brings us to our initiative, which is aligning uh, local elections in the village of Mamaroneck. So our proposal would lengthen term limits uh, or term lengths from two years to four years for local elected, elected officials. And it would align all elections so that none of them would be in an uh, off cycle year. So for example, um, uh, Tom Murphy and Nora Lucas are currently elected in 2021, or they had their election in 2021, but under our new system, they would be elected in 2024 and then 2028 and so on. Um, and the other group of incumbents, uh, their election under our new system would be 2022. And then after that, it'd be 2026, 2030, and so on. So we just believe that by aligning local elections, we can increase voter turnout and make sure that every part of the community is equally heard. And we do have legal justification for this project. So section 3-302 sub point seven of New York State Village Law says that through referendum, the trustees of any village can change the election date to even numbered years, as well as section 3-302 sub point five, which says that the terms of elected officials can be extended to four years. In addition, we talked to Mr. Spolzino, the village attorney, and he told us that our project was legal. So our proposed initiative is by no means unique. Um, basically, there are three jurisdictions across the country which have implemented a similar proposal which would align their local off-cycle elections with federal on-cycle elections. And as you, can, as you will see, it had great effect. So our first example is in Baltimore. In 2016, Baltimore's municipal elections were aligned with the national general election, and the 2003 election in September was postponed to November 2004 because of a clash between Maryland state election law and the Baltimore city charter. And as you can see by the calculations on the bottom right, Baltimore's turnout for elections in on-cycle years was 3.02 times higher than the off-cycle elections. Hmm. Another example is Austin, Texas. So in 2014, Austin moved their local elections to be aligned with national midterm elections. So 2014, 2016, uh, 2018, not 2016, sorry, brain burp. Um, and so if you look at the calculations in the corner, um, again, you see roughly a three times increase relative to off cycle elections once they moved their elections on cycle. 
So our final example is Phoenix, Arizona. They first aligned their elections in 2018 and then had their elections aligned for 2020 as well. Um, as we can see in this graph, uh, turnout was significantly higher in 2018 and 2020 than it was in the off-cycle elections. Um, and overall, turnout in on-cycle elections was around four times higher than it was in off-cycle elections, um, which is pretty big evidence that aligning elections would increase voter turnout uh, substantially. So aside from these three empirical examples, we also found some other research um, that would support aligning elections. So a poll conducted a few years ago found that 70% of voters nationwide favored uh, moving local elections to line up with larger ones. There was also a study from California that analyzed a few thousand municipal elections in the state, and it found that turnout was 25 to 36% higher in elections that were on cycle um, compared to those with off cycle. And there's also some momentum at the state level for aligning elections. So um, pretty recently, California, Kansas, Michigan, and um, Virginia have aligned all local elections in their state, and a few other states are also considering it as well. Um, so uh, apart from our evidence that aligning elections would increase voter turnout, we also found evidence that it would actually decrease expenditures, both for the voter and for the governments themselves. So governments wouldn't have to hold as many elections, so they wouldn't be uh, dedicating as many as much as many resources um, to holding elections as they are currently, and voters wouldn't have to vote as frequently. So they would have uh, they wouldn't have to take time off from work, um, get a babysitter, and do whatever else people need to do to vote. So now we're going to move to addressing potential concerns with this initiative. So a possible opposition to this proposal could be how the minority party is impacted. And as you can see from the graphs included on this slide, the minority party's margin of victory, how much they won or lost by, only suffered a negative 3% change in the on-cycle elections compared to the off-cycle elections. And this is a very small margin considering how the minority party have half as many registered voters in the village of Marinick. Another concern is that people will simply turn up you know, for their federal election to vote for president or representative, what have you, and then simply not move their pen down to vote for the local office, right? Um, our data isn't consistent with this. So we analyzed the 2012 election, the 2016 election, and compared them to um, local races in those years and found that roughly 87% of federal votes cast for president, representative, senator, um, were carried over to the local races. So it's a significant margin. Another thing people are concerned with is purely partisan voting. Um, so a possible concern is that because local elections will be aligned with national elections, people will be less likely to kind of split their ticket and vote Republican locally, vote Democrat federally, or vice versa. Um, our data isn't really consistent with this either. So, for example, in the 2012 Democratic votes for Congress in the village of Amerinik, we found that 6.7% of the Democrats who voted in the 2012 congressional election for the 16th district um, switched their tickets in a local race, demonstrating some degree of decision making right on the part of the voter. The results only get better with um, presidential elections. So, for example, in 2016, we found that 13% of the Democrats who voted in the 2016 presidential election switched their tickets in a local election. Um, and if we go to the next slide, the 2012 <laughs> election is even better um, and demonstrates a 16% margin of Democrats practicing split ticket voting in the 2012 election. So this proves that there is consistently some degree of differentiation between local and federal voting habits among voters in the village of America. And the final concern is if people will run for these four-year terms and the extension of the term length might appear as if it'll dissuade the population from running for four-year terms. But our analysis shows that a large proportion of village trustees have sought four years despite two-year term lengths. And as the data shows, 17 out of 23 village trustees have run for a second term. Um, and this results in 73.9% of village trustees seeking a four-year commitment. 
Overall, while the idea of four-year terms can seem like a huge change, the neighboring town of Amerinik, in fact, all towns in New York State, by law, have four-year terms for their board members. In this case, we believe that the benefits outweigh the possible criticisms. Not only are four-year terms much more cost-effective, but they can also help make a much more efficient government with officials who have really gotten the hang of their positions. As seen from the quote from Abby Katz, a town official in the town of Amerinik, we can see that there are many benefits to a town board that has been there for four years. <clears throat> so in conclusion, our project increases government accountability by increasing the amount of people voting in village elections. We believe that a village that has more people voting is a village that's more representative of the residents' interests. And in addition to simply increasing voter turnout, our project removes the less convenient odd number election years and this allows for more discourse during an election. And this encourages candidates to develop the best proposals to best address voters' problems. And our product is a further step towards principles of good government and broad representation. So by reducing expenditures, our project ensures that the funds appropriated in our government are used efficiently. While the money saved by our proposal isn't a massive amount, it's by no means insignificant symbolically. An efficient political system is a trusted political system, and we believe our project can enhance the image of the village in this area. As our testimony from Town of Marinic officials show, local officials with four-year terms are much more able to realize that their desired policies than officials burdened by an election every two years. Not only would our initiative help increase cohesiveness and the expertise of the board members, but it would also help for officials to take on important projects that will take longer than two years. Finally, our project simply makes it easier for voters to participate in local democracy. Essentially, we reduce the amount of miles voters have to drive, we reduce the amount of gas they have to get for those miles, the amount of time they have to take off from work. Essentially, all voters have to do now to participate in their local elections is move their pen down from whatever president or representative they're voting for in order to participate in local democracy. Um, we believe that by broadening the democratic and electoral process in the village, we can move towards a more effective and accountable form of government. Um, we hope to have our initiative on the ballot in the village of Amerinik in November 2022, giving voters the opportunity to extend terms and align local elections at their own accord. We hope village of Amerinik residents will support and eventually vote for such a referendum. Thank you very much for your time, and we hope you consider supporting this proposal. Um, just for um, some additional information, um, we will share a presentation with Summit Leadership for those interested in our research data and diving deeper into our analysis. Um, and if it's okay with the good folks at the summit, we would be happy to answer any questions in the chat or from the summit themselves about our project. Um, at this time, I don't know if there's more that you wanted to add in individually, but we normally would take questions and answers. And there's two means by which people can do that. Uh, those of you in the audience who, who would like to can uh, set, submit a, um, a question via chat using the icon at the bottom of your screen. I think there's already one in there from Marlene Colbert. And, uh, or you can raise your hand and LMC TV with Sean in charge will start answering, calling on those people in the order in which the, the hands have been raised. Um, so let, we can start with Marlene who's had her question up there for, for a little bit. And I also have a question for you, but um, Sean, you want to uh, read that question for for them and see where we go. Uh, sure. So Marlene Colbert has asked, does this also apply to the village of Larchmont? So um, in our original our original vision for our initiative, we planned on including the village of Larchmont. However, it doesn't look like we're going to have enough time and we've already built a lot of our political base right in the village of Amerinik. A lot of our work has been directed at village of Amerinik interest groups. So um, right now we're focusing on the village of Amerinik, but if it's in terms of our data, we would argue that the village of Amerinik is a good test case of and comparison of off cycle and on cycle election data. So we would think that our research holds true for the village of Larchmont as well, because we've also analyzed those three federal jurisdictions, those three city jurisdictions across the country, right? 
And they reflected similar increases in voter turnout when it's on cycle versus off cycle. There are a couple of more questions that have come in on the chat. Um, more than a couple, I guess. Um, Would you like me to go to the chat or the hands raised? Oh, um, well, let's take a couple from the chat and then go to, well, I guess people are sitting there with their hands raised. I don't think it matters as long as we get through all of them, but we might as well start with the chat and then move to hands raised, okay? All right, so next is um, Steve Otis says, does your proposal maintain staggered terms? Yes, so our proposal does keep the same two groups that are currently elected um, and terms are, and elections are gonna be run every two years. So that way we can keep the staggered elections. Okay, uh, next question in the chat is from Elsa Rubin. It says, how receptive are the elected village of Mamaroneck officials to this proposal? Great question. Um, we met with every single Village of Mamaroneck board member, including the mayor, Tom Murphy, last year in our effort to propose to the board. We actually did present this presentation to the board of trustees last year. Um, it just became a question of time for the board. So the board was fixated on the budget at the time. Um, so really we kind of had the wrong window of opportunity. It, so we're kind of coming around this year for a second attempt, trying to get this thing actually passed and set for a referendum. Um, but we met with, in meeting with all board members, we found that they were receptive to the proposal and were convinced by our data for the most part. Okay. Did you wanna go somewhere else, Nina? Uh no, I think we can um, keep going down the chat for now. All right. So next up is uh, Lauren Stahl. Says, is there any discussion of using the awareness capital of the odd year election day and applying the fact that voters would be would who would otherwise be voting that day can be come involved in civics or be somehow usefully engaged on election days when they do not actually vote. There is potentially a lot of dedication out there, which ought to be utilized to our community's best interests. That's a great, that's actually a great observation. And I think that would definitely be a great opportunity for this community, right? Having all these people who are dedicated enough or aren't busy enough to turn out in these off year elections. I think <laughs> it would be a boon for local organizations such as the summit and others. Um, for these voters who are already aware to engage themselves elsewhere other than voting, obviously. Um, so that is a great observation. And I think that would come into play if something like our initiative was implemented. Right. I think we can keep going down, down and uh, anyone whose hand is raised, maybe we do want to just write it into the chat and we'll keep going through the chat. Right. We also, I, we have plenty of time. So next up, we have Miriam Leo. It says, did you study Republican vote switching data? So at this time, we do not have Republican vote switching data, but that would definitely be constructive to the proposal, right? Answering that. Um, so we can really get back to you on that. We can analyze that data, really strengthen our claim in that section of the presentation. But at this time, we only have the Democrats vote switching data. Hmm. Next up from Luis Perez. Have you received any pushback from individuals on your proposal? Um, so in that area, this is actually where a lot of the concerns come, came from, right? Okay. So we met with a lot of stakeholders and local officials last year and kind of compiled all of their concerns with our project into these con the concern section of our presentation, right? So this idea of purely partisan voting, the split ticking voting stuff, the idea that federal votes won't necessarily carry over to local elections. Um, so we've tried the best we can to answer these concerns using data and further research. And we think we've accomplished this. So um, a lot, in, in most cases, we've gone back to the individual with our new data and said, hey, you know, we've come back to your question um, 
and we feel we've answered it. So I think we're doing a good job of constructively updating our research to answer the concerns of these individuals. Great. Uh, next we have from Jenny Gear. Have you examined the role of registering new voters as an element in increasing turnout? And does your program include pre-registering your fellow high school students, uh, which is currently permitted under New York law? <coughs> so actually I could, I'll jump in and just quickly answer that one. So um, for the last three years, actually maybe more right now, um, I have worked with the local um, large Mont Maranek League of Women Voters to register uh, all seniors um, with the change in New York state law that allows for pre-registration. Um, once again, this year at the very beginning of the school year, uh, again, working with um, the uh, local um, League of Women Voters, along with the assistance of my Oprah students and some of my AP government students, we registered all seniors. So every senior who was wow. eligible for pre-registration was registered. Um, and I do wanna again, thank uh, the local League of Women Voters for supporting that effort um, in terms of getting uh, voter registration forms that are necessary, delivering those voter registration forms to the um, Westchester County Board of Elections. So yes, um, that is something that has been in place for some time. Um, and it said that is also supported uh, both by <coughs> students as well as my EP Gov students. All right, uh, next up we have from County Executive George Latimer, says, I favor the proposal and would expand it to all local elections. But one argument against, I hear, is that local village town county issues would be sub subsumed under federal issues and local races will be a referendum on national themes. How do you respond to that? So um, we, would, we would respond to this with the split ticket voting data we've gathered. So we found that 15 to 20% of Democratic voters at least will switch tickets and vote Republican in the general election and Democrat on the local level or Republican in the general election, uh, Democrat on the, in the local level, right? So we would think this indicates some degree of local decision-making when voters go to the polls in these like even year elections. So, um, and also we would cross apply the data from sort of the minority party concerns and show that there actually is a pretty minute difference in the way the votes go between GOP and Dem on the local level in these even year election. It's a very minor margin. Um, obviously this could be a concern, but we found that the data doesn't reflect that this really swaying the election one way or the other. Um, but this could be addressed by further voter outreach. And I think we have a lot of local organizations which could minimize the impact of this possible effect. All right, uh, next up from Philip Oldham. With the plan, what about the difference between the turnout for presidential versus non-presidential years on local voting? So um, while there would be some variation in turnout, um, even in on-cycle elections, because presidential elections do typically have a higher turnout than all other elections. Um, we, we need to have some in the midterm year and some in the presidential year um, to stagger our elections so that not all five elected officials are elected at the same time. Um, we just constructed our project this way because we felt that if we had like five local elected officials on the ballot at one time, that would be too overwhelming for voters. So instead, we split it up into some would be elected um, in presidential years and some in midterm years. And um, even though like midterm years do have a typically lower turnout than presidential years, it's still a big improvement um, from off cycle years. Next from Fran Snedecker, are there any implications of your proposal on school board elections? So you have any proposal oh, sorry, Olivia, go. So our proposal doesn't have any implications on the school board elections. It, right now, it wouldn't impact the school board, and that would stay how it is. All right. Uh, next up from Shelley Mayer, I believe our state senator. Did you interview or speak with any voters who did not vote in off-year elections to see if this change would influence their voting behavior? 
Um, so currently we did not speak with any uh, voters if see if it would change their behavior, but it's going to be on the same ballot. So all voters need to do is go down the list. So if they're turning out for the presidential or midterm elections, they're going to have the option to vote on the same ticket. And we've also looked at the data and we saw that voters have voted in where they made this proposal. They voted all the way down the ticket uh, the majority of the time. So voters will still be going to the same elections that they would anyway. So it would be on the same ballot as presidential and midterm elections. Yes. Yeah, so it, it would be it's an 87 percent mar margin of people voting for president or representative and then voting for mayor or board of trustee. But we would we would say this is a great idea. Um, we would conduct something like this to further solidify the support for our proposal. I don't know if I see any other questions in the chat. Should I move on to? I, I do have a question I would like to ask you, though. Um, the election data that you reviewed, were all of those uh, elections, as far as you know, contested? So if there were two open seats, were there two candidates, only one candidate, or no candidates? And did you study, did you happen to study the impact of having uncontested elections on voter voter turnout, or was that sort of outside the purview of your project? We did actually examine this effect. It's actually, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, so we found that there wasn't really a correlation. So this is actually a recent trend. Um, so um, I believe 2018, 2019, uh, 2020, these years are usually, these years are uncontested. 2019 might not be, but we found that recently, 2017, it, it basically after 2016, there were a lot of uncontested elections in the village. Um, we believe this is probably due to the large gap in registration between Democrats and Republicans. And, you know, we've interviewed a lot of local officials who say that the local Republican Party is kind of demoralized um, in some instances and don't really want to put out candidates sometimes because of this large gap. We have exceptions, such as in 2019, the Friendly Village Party, put together by Norm, by Norm Rosenblum, um, who essentially tried to challenge this, right? But we would say this is insulated from the issue of off-cycle, on-cycle, right, because of recent political trends. But we would defend that by increasing participation in our system and by broadening the people who have representation by including these communities of color, Allow, giving them a better opportunity to participate in local democracy, maybe there will be a there will be political expediency for certain candidates to start challenging incumbents and start running on their own to represent broader interests. Mm -hmm. So we think our project is probably a step in the right direction for local politics because more voters will be encompassed and be given a better opportunity to participate. Okay. Uh, do we, um, Sean, do we have any more questions? I don't see any more on, so, on the chat. I think Anne Chodash asked, uh, if we aren't having separate village elections, we would save money because we wouldn't need the poll watchers, et cetera. Uh, you might want to look at the cost savings or if you want to speak on, if you have looked on the cost savings that village may potentially have in this situation. Yeah, so we um, actually have done some research on the cost savings. Um, we found evidence that it would save money um, for the election administrators and the voters because the less elections were being held. And there was also um, a study from a professor at Rice University um, who did research and found that uh, when, when elections were um, held concurrently with on-cycle races, then um, the cost would be lower for, you, for municipalities. So that's a great point. And we did find evidence um, in favor of the idea that it would save money for the um, election administrators. We have another question from Ann McAndrews. What progress has been made in writing a resolution for the November referendum? So this is still in progress. Um, last year, um, we met with village attorney Bo uh, Robert Spolzino and Mayor Tom Murphy, and they assured us that a resolution was being drafted at the time. I'm sure it is still on file. And when we come back around this year, 
uh, where they can resume construction of the proposal. Um, we've been, so our mentors actually have been instrumental in reapplying that pressure to continue working on this resolution and continue working on the legislative language of our proposal. But really, it'll come down to our second attempt on convincing the board to move forward with a referendum. And it'll depend on that. There has to be political pressure, which is why we are going around and trying to build support with groups like this. Um, so all hands on deck, we're trying to really get this thing moving forward this year. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Would you like me to move on to the raised hands? Sorry, I couldn't hear you, Sean. There, I don't see any other questions in the chat, but we do have a couple hands raised. Oh, please, yes, let's, right. let's hear them. So first up, we have John Gitlitz. You can just unmute yourself, you can ask a question. That's interesting because I don't remember raising my hand if I did it as an accent and I don't have an additional question beyond those that have already been asked. So I'll let, I'll let, I'll let them off easily. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up then we have our County Executive, George Latimer. Sorry folks, took me a little while to unmute. Um, I really do think that this is a, an important dialogue to have to move elections to when most people come out to vote. I did ask the question, and I know you've done some study, I think we probably need, in addition to statistical study, um, the kind of um, um, you know, thing that you'll do with uh, people in a room uh, and, and dialogue with a professional uh, advocate, not just for the village though, if we do this on a broader basis, because I do think that I'm concerned that if we do have local elections at the same time we have larger level elections, that it will be subsumed into that larger debate about the presidency or the governorship. And then you're not really focusing on the county executive, the mayor, the county legislature, which already have less attention on the local issues, not even just personalities, but local issues. But I compliment you. I think it's a great uh, proposal and uh, I hope you continue to advance it. Thank you so much. And yes, that is a great idea. I think we should, I think we, we will be moving forward because I think that is a definitely a valid concern um, and logically makes sense. I think we should probably look into that data in a way that you've described. I think a focus group would be a good idea uh, to kind of test this hypothesis, but great idea. I think anything we can do to solidify this proposal would be Definitely constructive. Thank you. Are there more hand ra hands raised, Sean? Yep. Uh, now we have Marlene Colbert. Hi. First of all, I want to congratulate you guys. You did a great job. And I saw Justin talking about uh, climate change the other day at the Martin Luther King, and he was very articulate. And I need to go slightly off topic. I understand that within the Oprah project, you're doing something on collecting compostables. Where can I get more information about that? I think this is uh, Mr. Liberty. This is a Liberty <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, Marlene, I'll make a note and I'll reach out to you. Uh, Thank you, I, I appreciate yes. that. Yes, we do have, there is an Oprah project um, that's been ongoing for about a year and a half um, where they do um, food scrap um, pickup, curbside pickup in order to increase participation in- um, I would love to know more about that, thank yes, you. Yes, I will reach, I, will, I promise to make note and reach out to you after this. Thank, thank you very you. much. Sure. Sean, do we have more hands raised? Because it looks like we have perhaps two more questions in the chat. I'm not sure if one was already answered, but- um, Yeah, we have one more question in the chat from Fran Snebecker. It says, what can we do to promote your proposal with the Village of Marinick Board? So, Great question. There's a few things you can do. So first of all, you can write emails, letters to your local board member, to your to the mayor, um, saying that you support this proposal and that you would like to see it on the ballot in November of 2022. Another thing you can do is you can send us um, your email address. Um, so we're going to provide our contact information probably towards the end of the meeting. 
Um, and you can give us your email. And when the time comes for us to present to the board once again this year, um, we will contact you and possibly ask you to, you know, voice your support in front of the board um, just to show that there's popular support behind our proposal. Um, so that's how you can support. Um, we also have a number of local groups which are supporting us so you can support them. So the Hispanic Democrats, for example, the Community Resource Center, these have expressed interest in our project. Um, so supporting them would be a great way to also help us. Um, so great question. I have another question if you have, have one moment. I may be wrong on the facts. I think at one point in time, the village of Larchmont's elections were held in the spring. Were they, were they moved to the autumn? And if they were and when they were, was there any kind of notable, if you studied it even, uh, difference in participation? Did you look at that by any chance? So we haven't looked at that. This actually did happen. Yes, it was a referendum recently in the village of Larchmont because they held, as you said, they held elections in May, not November. Um, we haven't looked at that because um, in the village of Ameronic, right, elections are held in November already. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't really see how this would kind of affect the project there. But I think it's I think it's definitely I think it's definitely something to, worth looking into because across the state, there are a lot of villages who still hold their elections in May. Um, so that's definitely yeah, that's definitely something else we should work towards moving those elections to November. I'm not trying to put more work on your plate, believe me. <laughs> no, it's that's what we do. It's totally fine. I think there's two more, Sean, from Lynette and from Marlene again. Uh, yes. So uh, the first question from Lynette is directed to Mr. Liberty. It says, could Mr. Liberty share topics that some of the other projects that students are involved with, how many students are involved in the program? Thank you for those questions. So uh, currently there's about 125 students in the OCRA program from the freshman year all the way up to the senior uh, year. Um, in terms of projects, uh, senior projects, uh, obviously you just heard about one, which is increasing voter engagement um, by aligning local elections um, with federal election schedules. Uh, we also have a food scrap recycling um, pickup program um, to increase participation um, uh, in the food scrap recycling um, program. Uh, we all have another uh, senior group working on uh, tenant eviction prevention. Um, by uh, increasing outreach and intake programs, as well as um, moving towards right to council for Westchester residents facing eviction. Um, they've probably read about um, these various proposals at different times, but those are uh, some of them at the senior level, at the, at the junior level. We have a group working on reducing um, single uh, use plastics at local restaurants. Um, we have another group looking at improving recycling at Maranac High School. Um, we currently have a single stream system and students are looking into uh, other systems, perhaps dual, um, dual stream that might lead to uh, a more efficient and effective uh, recycling, um, capturing more, um, basically capturing more uh, potential recyclables um, from getting into landfills. Another group is focused on summer slide. That's the loss in sort of uh, skills um, and habits over the summer. Um, among low income students, particularly in the area of reading. Another group is looking at uh, increasing uh, voter turnout, um, but they're specifically focused on uh, 18 year olds, newly registered voters, and using certain strategies to increase their um, voter turnout uh, by basically uh, using um, social media and other forms to contact them just before elections. Uh, we're also have another group looking at um, wasted food, trying to capture and distribute food um, that otherwise would go to waste, particularly within the uh, school system. Um, one group is also uh, looking at wage theft. Uh, it's a continued problem. While there's been work at the state and county level to address that, um, students are looking to increase awareness and reporting of wage theft. Uh, we also have two groups looking at um, sustaining and helping grow or support, I should say, uh, Large Mont's business district um, by increasing uh, demand at local eateries. Another group is looking at um, 
actually they're already doing this, they're designing and testing uh, marketing strategies um, for brick and mortar clothing retailers in the large mom business district. And so they're working with a particular store owner. Uh, they're um, testing out um, SMS strategies, text-based strategies, as well as utilizing TikTok as a platform uh, for promoting um, a business. And that's something that they're doing in conjunction with, again, uh, the a store owner along with additional mentors in the business community. So all those projects are currently in play. All of them have mentors from the community. Again, I want to say thank you so much to the mentors. It makes all the difference. Um, so, and then there were several projects that were uh, that were done last year. These seniors are now in college, and those range from uh, environmental. Um, they have actually a fair number of environmental projects. Uh, one of them you might be familiar with. Um, they created an, a, an app for the village of Larchmont, free to the village for two years and obviously free to residents. And the purpose of that app was to increase um, the ease of communication between elected officials at the village of uh, Largemont uh, with residents. Um, and the nice thing about that app um, is it pulled together sort of the most important information and allowed for a much more um, sort of frictionless uh, form of communication with residents. Um, it also had the option to allow residents to, re to actually um, respond back to um, uh, elected officials via polling. So it gave an opportunity for a two-way form of communication. Um, so those are some examples of uh, projects from se past seniors who are now freshmen in college. Uh, there seems to be one more question from John Gitlitz and then I think probably Elaine, you would tell me that we're out of time. <laughs> we're right at the edge, go ahead. Uh, uh, so that question from John Gitlitz, I how are the choices as to what projects will be addressed made? Yeah, so that's again, a really a question for me. So it's in the research phase of the sort of second half of the freshman year in across that summer into the sophomore year where students who are conducting qualitative and quantitative research are discovering the various issues within the community. So, in that sense, they're introduced to a whole array of, of issues to the research process. Those are issues um, that, again, um, could be about uh, gaps or, or, or challenges for local officials that might be addressed that they've raised themselves. Um, it could be issues around crime and policing. It could be a whole array of different environmental issues. So it's through the research process that they're coming to understand all the various challenges at the local level again, during their uh, freshman, second half of freshman year through that summer into the sophomore year. At that point, it's really up to students to decide, you know what, we wanna understand more about, for example, wage theft. You know, we've heard it repeated over and over in various forms of our research process, that's an issue. So then at that point, students on their own sort of decision, form small groups of three, maybe four, and begin to further research that particular issue, for example, wage theft. Through that process, they begin to link up with community stakeholders who have knowledge and interest in that issue. And from that, eventually mentors are found. And at that point, the uh, group moves forward and begins to sort of problem solve around that particular issue, thinking about our, what part of that could we potentially address with some type of action project over the next you know, two years. I, I think we're going to start winding this up because we <laughs> are run out of time, but thank you, Joe. Thank you, Olivia, Justin, Jackson, Daniel. Your presentation was really enlightening and very thrilling and exciting for all of us to see the kind of engagement that our young people have in solving some local problems. Uh, thank you, Nina and Sean as well. Um, and thank you all of you for attending. I hope to see you next month uh, on February 9th, uh, I'm sorry, February 8th, Tuesday, February 8th, when Steve Otis, Shelley Mayer, and Catherine Parker will report on the local impact of state and county legislation. So see thank you, you everyone for, for participating. You. I, I really appreciate it. You guys have, are amazing students and it's a, it's a pleasure, a real pleasure. Thank you for having us. This was a great opportunity. And I just want to thank all the summit leadership and members um, for allowing us to come and present. It was really great. Thank you. It was, it was great having you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Take care all. Right. Stay warm. Right. <laughs> and stay safe.